you all for coming. I know this is a topic that um, we have, um, is, is a concern to many of us, and we have talked about it a, a number of times. You know, I was thinking about it in terms of timing, and I was thinking, you know, we're like halfway through the semester when um, Nancy first uh, gave us some proposed dates and this and that, and then I'm like, oh boy, you know what? We'll be almost like halfway through the semester. But then, you know what? That's not a bad thing. Maybe it's a good thing that the timing is that, you know, we're halfway through the semester and it's a, um, often a time where issues come up in the classroom. I find that both students and um, instructors get fatigued as the semester goes on. So, you know, we're first back from spring break, so that's a good thing, and people have a little bit of energy, but, you know, people tend to get more testy as we um, go through the semester and stuff, so uh, maybe it is a good time um, to have this conversation um, with you about uh, classroom management and as I put for learning and student success because I think that's why everybody really comes here. Students really want to come um, and learn. Students come with high expectations, you know, when, when uh, SESI does their national survey on students, all the students come with high expectations about, you know, I'm going to get good grades. If you have students in the beginning when they first start college, everybody's going to be an A student and everybody's going to graduate and everybody, you know, and and all the teachers come bright-eyed and, you know, filled with the love of teaching and wanting to share and, you know, and uh, they want everybody to do well, you know, so everyone comes with all these wonderful intentions. And then real life happens. <laughs> the reality sets in. So, uh, so, we, so we have to deal with it. And I am taking the approach of, um, as I said, you know, managing the classroom. Um, faculty are the classroom managers. I always say that to everybody. You know, you're in charge of your classroom. You're the faculty manager. And, um, you know, I certainly think it's one of those things where the more experience you have, the more experience, um, the better you're able to handle situations. And most of our veteran faculty, um, I rarely see them with problems, though even they get thrown a curveball sometimes and they come to me. But for the most part, over the years, you know, and I ask them, what do you do? And they say, Doris, I come in in the very beginning and, you know, for the most part, I set the stage early on. And um, that's how we're going to start today. We're going to talk about setting the stage early on and what we can do. So hopefully we will create an environment from the very beginning. Um, that will lend itself to uh, learning and uh, student success. And then we'll talk about if we have a problem, um, what what happens, okay? Um, some of the things I'm going to sh uh, share with you, and I, over time, have collected information about, you know, what the classroom is supposed to be, and, you know, I think um, what I put together is kind of a compilation of um, a number of things, and I think it's, this is probably Utopia that says, what is the classroom? A place where critical thinking takes place, questioning, discovery, a laboratory for experimenting and trying until you achieve success. A place where faculty can share their love of the subject matter, encourage success, and create future scholars. Places where students realize the unlimited opportunities and how they can contribute to society. And I think that is, you know, may, you know maybe it is um, utopia, but, but I do think that that's the ideal. Now, the reality is that um, the student body in higher education has changed tremendously um, and next month, I celebrate 20 years of Capital Community College. Mm -hmm. And um, student body is very different from when I came here. Um, and I think, um, I'm not sure if I shared this with adjuncts, but I know I shared it um, when we had convocation in the fall, too. I mean, the shift in demographics of our students, mm -hmm. and we um, continually see them get younger. And now, 30% of our uh, student population is now what we call traditional age students uh, between the age of um, 18 and 22. Uh, you know, most of our students work. Um, many now come for transfer. Um, many of this is first time college experience. Um, and so, in the classroom, we have populations within populations of students. You know, you have older students, you have 
you know, working students, career changers, and like I said, and all these students who might have traditionally gone to a University of Connecticut or state university systems, but for economic reasons and the fact that in Connecticut, um, as well as many places around the country, um, there's a whole trickle-down admissions going on because um, many students who might have gone to the more selective schools who can't afford to go to there are not the University of Connecticut, which means the University of Connecticut bumps all the students down the state university systems, and so, um, you know, our doors are overflowing. So, uh, when I was doing some research um, on uh, community colleges last year, this is what they say about, you know, um, diverse student bodies and um, some of the challenges that they bring with them. Um, uh, we have high percentages, typically at community colleges, um, like I said, beside the fact that we have a mix of ages and ethnicity, we have high percentages, percentages of first generation students. We have high percentages of academically underprepared students needing developmental education. We have a large percentage of low income students. We have mixed classrooms with younger students versus baby boomers. And we have a significant number of students who are ESL or ELL or international students. Um, we have significant number of students with learning disabilities. Um, the majority of our students are, um, not the majority, but a large population of them are single parents, many who are juggling work, school, and family. And um, we have a growing population of students with mental health issues. So that's just probably, you know, a small summary of it. The, the, the reverse side of it is that um, many of us, and we've seen the same trend at Capitol and around the system with retirement and stuff, um, we have a very veteran, um, for the most part, I, feel, I have to study for my exam. Faculty so. population. Um, but like I said, we're seeing that shift only because of the last couple of years. I don't know the answer, of course. Last year we had a big exodus with the retirement package. The year before we had, so two consecutive years, we really have had major exodus of faculty, of veteran faculty, but still, um, we have lots of veteran faculty. Um, are accustomed to teaching one way, are not necessarily uh, equipped um, to deal with um, issues in the classroom because quite frankly and um, for many years um, we, we didn't have a lot of issues in the classroom it was it was minor um, you know probably I always I would always say probably you know um, less than five percent of my job deals with those kinds of issues I would say something very different right now <laughs> but you know um, like I said certainly 20 years ago when I started this um, it was a very minute part of the job and it has become a growing um, part of the job so the best thing that we can do though is to try to deal with these issues up front to create an environment in the very beginning of the semester um, you know that will set the stage where we establish uh, mutual respect in an environment where everybody knows the rules um, and college classrooms are no different from the rest of the society the microcosms of the rest of the society. In general, people are um, in society are more impatient, are more rude, are more uncivil. Um, you know, that doesn't it doesn't matter if you're at a college classroom, doesn't matter if you're at Starbucks, um, you know, in the mall or whatever, on the road where people are cutting you off. So we everywhere we go we have to establish the um, you know the, the rules for engagement and um, what is expected of, um, you know, classroom. Um, two weeks ago, I was in Chicago. I was there for the National Association of Student Personnel Administrators um, um, National Conference, and I was part of this um, uh, Senior Student Affairs um, think tank, and I had, you know, been selected to come and, and talk about issues and, you know, the change in higher education and where we're going for the future. And uh, we were rereading um, some of Boyer's work, and he writes about um, community and he has kind of a seminal book that he wrote about in the 1990s about you know establishing a sense of community um, in colleges and so we're talking about you know um, 
does that still apply today? And what does community look like, you know, in 2010 as opposed to what it looked like in 1990? And um, do the populations we serve want something different? And uh, probably so. We're not sure that we have determined what it is. And so, um, but like I said, everybody is noticing the change. Okay, so now when we're dealing with um, adults, uh, students, and some of the things I'm going to say, I'm going to simplify only just for the sake of this, um, because like I said, we have lots of different populations, but, you know, in the one sense, like I said, we have this very traditional age population, and then we have this adult learners. Now, um, with the traditional age students, like I said, most of them, this is the first time um, college experience, and um, they don't know the difference between what is expected in college and what was expected in high school. So we have to teach them that in the very beginning we have to spend some time, you know, um, teaching them what are the expectations and how is it different. And, uh, you know, when I, when I talk to, um, you know, tradition, traditional age students, I always say, you know, um, the majority of our students are working adults. Um, they make great sacrifices to come to this college. They're working hard, you know, to pay, you know, for housing as well as tuition, and um, when you, if you create an issue in the classroom, you're not just dis um, disrupting your own learning, you're disrupting the learning of people who came here some days after a long, tired day of work and have to, you know, came here to learn, and, um, and not to mention, of course, the faculty. On the other hand, we have adults in the classroom who um, come with different expectations. Uh, expectations about, you know, what's expected. Many of them come with lots of experience. Many of them are professionals. And so we have to respect that in the very beginning and we have to give them credit. And sometimes we neglect to acknowledge that these people are managers, supervisors often sometimes. They have more computer experience than us. They have more of the types of experience. So how do we garnish that experience and use it to our benefit in the classroom? So, you know, you have older students who uh, want to be respectful for the experience they bring, and we want to use that experience to engage them. Like I said, then we have younger students. Um, like I said, just to simplify this, we have younger students who we've got to establish all these rules about what is expected, and, you know, this is a syllabus, and I'm not going to tell you that the homework has to be done, you know, and that the test is then you read the syllabus, and so we have to do that. And I certainly think that what we invest up front in the classroom at the beginning of the semester, um, you know, will make a difference about how our semester uh, will go. So capitalize on the strengths and the knowledge that the students bring with them to the learning situation. It's a key method to engage um, learning. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to mention some basic uh, premises of, of classroom management. Uh, we talked about one here. We have to create an environment in the very beginning about um, this is a learning environment and what is expected of all of us as citizens of this learning environment, what's expected of us. Um, secondly, we're going to use the tools that are available to us um, at the institution that will help us be successful. Number one is your syllabus, okay? And I know at Capitol we have a template for what's to be on a syllabus, but that's just the start of it. We expect everyone to add to it, and everyone certainly, um, you know, adds the assignments and those kinds of things. Um, but as faculty, you have a lot of leeway in terms of what else you can add on there. As long as it's nothing that breaks board trustees policy or college policy in general, you got a lot of leeway in terms of the kinds of things that um, you can add. And I have one um, adjunct um, who, who um, I often talk to comes to see me and I had asked her for a copy of her syllabus if she didn't mind because she was telling me some things I thought were very uh, you know, good that she put on her syllabus. And she, um, like I said, she adds all kinds of things besides the usual about contact information and telephone numbers. And, um, but, you know, she, she's very clear, of course, on grading and how students will be assessed. And, um, but also, you know, just in general about what's expected of them in the classroom. So, you know, her, her syllabus was so straightforward and so clear. Students got a real sense. When I read, about syllabus, I was like, I have a real sense of 
who this teacher is and what their expectations are, um, you know, of me. And so, whether we put it on the syllabus, which I encourage, um, you can't put everything, but um, as much as possible without making, you know, a 28 Page. <laughs> 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 and, and, and I use that to be somewhat facetious about a couple of my courses at Nova had 28, 29 page syllabus. I mean, you really had to study the syllabus. I really spent a lot of time trying to memorize, you know, the syllabus and this and that. And, you know, I find myself, you know, always reading it a couple times in the beginning of the semester, but always going back, you know, besides pulling out the dates and putting them on your calendar and all that kind of stuff. It's like, um, this is a bit overkill they make sure they didn't miss anything so use your syllabus to help establish the rules of the course and expectations of the course okay um, and utilize college policies um, you know one of the things and I um, send this out electronically and I'm not sure that I send this to adjuncts but probably so I don't know but, uh, you know, from the student handbook, and when I send it out electronically about what is appropriate classroom behavior, um, I have a signature page that is added to this. Yeah, you've got that. Okay. I've given it out after. Okay. And exactly. And I tell the faculty, it's up to them, that they can put, um, they can have students even sign it. But I do encourage you um, at the beginning of the semester, if nothing else, if you don't talk about other classroom behavior, um, that you at least use this as the basis, you know. And this is a handout that um, one of the committees, um, maybe it was CAP or FSSDA, I think maybe FSSD, many years ago, and I kind of, um, you know, updated along the way. But, you know, we had this discussion and they kind of came up with, you know, a draft on some of the things that were universal. And, uh, you know, as the time changes and as technology changes, um, you have to, you know, update it. And I have. And I even had a student at the beginning of this semester who was, um, had a telephone in class and it would ring and they would excuse themselves as a teacher if they could be excused and they'd go on the hallway so that was good for <laughs> that was good because you know we've had other types of experience but but did not know that telephones were not allowed in the classroom so um you know they came into me he came in to speak to me and explain to me why he had to have his phone on it was because of his job and that kind of thing he had the kind of job so he had to have a phone so I said, yes, but how about if the 24 other students in the class all had to be, even though you say, excuse me, and you leave the classroom to talk on the phone, how about all class long, if 24 right. people are, you know, getting a little signal saying, it's annoying, even though he, and he did take it off a ring, but still, the signal that comes through, I find it annoying when I'm places when I hear that coming through, and I think that's annoying to other people, especially in the classroom. So then when I put it in that context, he's like, oh yeah, I guess we couldn't have 25 people in the classroom who are getting signals, they got to go outside and take this phone call. So, you know, but the important thing was that I was able to go to this page and say, it says right here, the telephones are not allowed in the classroom. So then he was more accepting of it because I had it in writing and I showed him because before that he was he was like, there's no policy on how I have the phone. And then I said, excuse me? <laughs> so um, like I said, if we have things in writing, we can reference them, then that's a good thing. But um, one way or another, I do suggest that um, we spend a significant amount of time during the first class, going over the syllabus, going over, um, you know, the um, policy on appropriate classroom behavior, and talking to students about creating an environment that's respectful for everybody, and uh, acknowledging that, you know, everybody has come here um, wanting to learn and to be successful, and that, uh, we have the same goals as them. I have yes. a question. It, it, since the honeymoon period is definitely open mm -hmm. to students mm -hmm. this semester, this is a great time to have it. Right. Um, I've had students show up after three or four weeks mm -hmm. and wanting to know what they missed and right. yeah. what they missed <laughs> okay. me. And um, I had, had respectfully reserved the right to change my syllabus because every class is a, its its own organic whole. When I don't recognize these students and they come in, 
and they demand, they said, we have no policy. Um, <laughs> I let them sit there, and um, <laughs> uh, but I said they, that from day one, there is no specific policy, but there is a participation grade that you will get in your class. Now, if you show up for, they come out of the blue, and I really do not know who these people are, and I have to say, hello, how are you, who are you, are you in the right room? Um, and it's been three or four weeks uh, without notes, without calling me, and everybody has mine. Um, I'm putting that up there because um, can we park it and come back to it? Okay. Yeah. And uh, but there are other things too. People tell me I'm going to put because um, I don't want to get off track, but that's a major issue that we're going to have to talk about because <laughs> I think um, it's fairly common. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that we want to do is talk about that up front in the beginning of the semester. We can talk about attendance. And the college does actually have a, a, a loose attendance policy, so, uh, but I'll talk about that in a, in a moment. All right, so that's what we want to do there. Um, the other thing we want to do, and um, all the gurus of classroom management will probably tell you, that we want to have some methodology to get um, evaluations and student feedback um, of how the semester is going along. So about after the first 30 days of class, it's a good time to spend, you know, 10 or 15 minutes in your class doing a status check with students about what's going well, what's not going so well, how can we all make this work for us, um, if there are things that are unclear, um, you know, and, and again, to kind of reinforce some of the policies or the importance of turning in work, in a timely manner according to what is stated in the syllabus and those kinds of things. So, um, you know, like I said, somewhere on down the line do that um, about 30 days after the semester starts. Yes, and I've also found it took me a couple of years to realize this, but that my students do take courses with other people. Right. And they get and they get all mixed up. Uh -huh. So they, you know, cause, because I questioned, well, do I have it in the syllabus, don't you remember us reviewing it? But they, they're taking three or four other classes. Exactly. With yeah. people with other policies. So exactly. You have to keep that in mind. And you have to recognize that. I mean, there are students are full-time students. They're taking four or five courses, and they're trying to keep up with what's this uh, faculty member saying and what's this. And like I said, because we do leave a lot of independence, like I said, the, the policies of the institution are the same for everybody, but it is difficult when... Um, you got to keep up uh, with four or five faculty members, and they have different policies on, you know, how I'll be penalized if I turn in a late paper, and how I won't, and if I do this, and so, and, you know, some people only want their work submitted electronically, and some don't, and it's a lot to keep up. Mm -hmm. yeah. That question, I really need to answer because it's a real issue. Yeah, we're coming back to it, so we're just parking it for. We're parking it. We're parking it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So, because I just wanted to go through, like I said, um, finished um, these strategies on, you know, doing checks and balances with students so that, one, we're getting feedback, and like I said, and we're reminding them, you know, and now is another good time to talk to students, um, especially since you get uh, halfway through the semester and, um, you know, you have, you know, if you have a significant amount of students in your class and often, you know, um, you may have had a midterm before the break or right after, so it's a good time also to check with students because this is another time where we lose a lot of students. There are peak times during the semester where we find um, our, 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 we have great attrition of students. And typically, you know, we start to see it around the, um, the fourth wave. That's one wave. We typically see another wave, um, you know, after spring break. And then the most surprising one probably is what happened? students who disappear at the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. what? You know, and I and I oh, um, some of you know I teach also um, some time and um, find it really perplexing, frustrating, and everything else when I have a student who has gone through the whole semester, is passing the course. And here it is, week 13, 14, they disappear. Or they just don't show up for the final, or they don't turn in the last, you know. How do we handle that? But it's 
which is why this is a good time, like I said, to talk to students about and maybe to give them some motivation about um, getting through the end of semester and not becoming frustrated about, because sometimes, and life happens, quite frankly, most of the time they disappear late in the semester and they're passing the course, it's because life has happened to them. But if we can connect with them, and one of the things I always say to students up front, um, you know, when I teach a class, if there's anything, absolutely anything, I tell them the very first day, um, that's going to prevent you from completing this class, I need you to talk to me. Absolutely, do not walk away. You need to, because most of the issues I find are not in the salon stuff. Um, they can be worked out, but students often have a sense that it's hopeless, there's no way I can manage this course, there's no way I can sell it, there's no my work schedule, I have a family issue, my child has become sick, I love babysitters, and sometimes we lose our best <coughs> students for reasons like that. So, yeah. um, like I said, so let's let's do a check, um, like I said, when we come back from spring break about students and, you know, how they're doing and how they're feeling and, um, you know, if there's anything that's going to prevent them from um, getting into uh, to the class. Okay. So. Doris, is it I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, wait. Uh, if you have a student who, oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. If you have a student that stops, just stops showing up out of the blue, uh, how do you suggest getting in touch with them? Like sending an email or? Absolutely. Or call them. I call students. I know, I mean, and, and, and it varies. And I'm not teaching four or five courses <laughs> at a time either. So, you know, but I often, you know, if I'm teaching one course, it always shocks them to death when I call them. It's like, <laughs> oh my God, you noticed? You know, first of all, it's like the shock factor. First of all, you noticed that I wasn't there, okay? And I don't typically call them after one class, but after, if they miss two classes, then I call them. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, I email them. So they usually almost always show up after that. Yeah. You know, because I share them now, you know, so they're, and plus I'm paying attention. I'm like, ah, oh, you know this, and you know, then I'll ask them some time after they're, you know, can I speak to you after class and I see you for a minute, and I'll ask them if everything okay, and you know, if there's something that, uh, you know, can be temporary, and I can help you with. Okay. So I'm curious, do you call from your home phone? Uh, most of them I call from the college phone. Yeah. I come in right after class and, and go to my office and call Because I don't want them calling me back. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, most, um, yeah, and most, and most, uh, you can give them another number. And most of the faculty here, I mean, the adjuncts have some designated phone that they have students contact them at. And so whatever they choose, you know, and many of them also have email. Sometimes email comes just for that purpose. So that's up to you to designate how you, you know, where you want students to contact you at. Um, like I said, but yeah, I do, I do call students and then often uh, surprise them and I email them and like I said, but uh, interestingly, they, they mostly support, um, they mostly um, do respond. Okay, um, before I get to the next place I'm going to is um, uh, what to do when you uh, in, in, in encounter a problem situation. Um, but before I go there, I'm going to answer this. Um, or it's just another question. Okay, all right. So what happens, the question was, what happens when students return after three or four weeks of missing class? Um, it seems, I think right now it's one of, um, uh, um, students disappearing is one of the biggest problems that we probably have. I see, well, this is a growing trend, at least that I see both from students and the faculty. It's a growing trend that students um, disappear um, for two or three weeks at a time and come back and, you know, explain they have life situations and, you know, now, um, there are a couple of things that help to shape this policy. One is, um, in the student handbook, it actually says if you're going to be gone, um, for more than a week or something like that, you should contact the counselor or the dean of students' office, and we will notify your faculty. We offer that, okay? We also tell, you know, students to contact faculty during orientation. That's one of the things. And again, you should have it on your syllabus, telling students, you know, if you're going to be gone, you know, um, for more than a class, you need to email me and or call me and tell me what's going on. Because most faculty will work with the students if they know what's going on. But often mm -hmm. students um, 
just disappear, I find. And of course, with the early alert system, I'm also now have more access to this because I'm reading. Um, I read all of those alerts. Sometimes not in detail, but I just always look at the line because um, at this point, I sign every single early alert letter myself mm -hmm. that goes out to a student. And um, by far, the most common problem is that students are missing classes. Mm -hmm. They also miss assignments and that kind yeah. of stuff. But um, often, um, they're being reported because they are missing classes or Dr. Miller says, I can see them in two weeks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and like I said, we talked about <coughs> attendance policies before and um, how, how they vary in the college does kind of have a loose, but you know, faculty can have tighter or enforce, or like I said, you saw kind of um, individually tailor that. Some faculty members say, I don't care if students, you know, really tend to, as long as they do the work. And some, of course, you know, class participation is a significant part of, of the grade, so it makes a difference. And my philosophy is like, you know, Yogi Berra, 50% um, of the job is showing up. So I expect you to come to class most time unless there's, you know, um, like I said, but I guess it varies because, you know, like I said, um, depending on the type. Some people teach computer classes and they say, I don't care if the student quote um, comes. They got four projects they have to complete and they need to do it as long as they handle those four assignments. And, but, uh, but we should um, intervene in one way or another when students are missing classes like this. But like I said, we do have a couple of things that um, support it. One, we do tell students to notify us. So that's a way that um, does support the faculty in terms of enforcing it. The other thing, it actually says, um, I think after three weeks, and I don't want to quote verbatim, but so we're in the student handbook in the catalog, it says, a student like think misses more than three weeks of class, they actually need the signature of the academic dean to be readmitted into class. Okay. So there, there is a policy on if you miss, you can't just disappear for, now I must say, five weeks and I know this person was. Yeah. I must say that this is a policy that has been challenged at this college and the system and nationally. Can we really tell students you can't get to return? Now, um, our attorneys have said to us, we have been said to us that, you know, students pay for courses and, you know, maybe you don't have any right to tell them that they can't come to class when they pay for the course because um, there is the principle, you know, students have a right to fail, yeah. yes. but, um, and students do have a right to fail. Um, because sometimes students, um, faculty, and I do say to faculty, don't tell the students, because sometimes faculty say to students, you know, three quarters of the way through the semester, you already fail and there's no way you can pass this course. Well, students have the right to stay, and they stay for different reasons. Sometimes they want to learn the material, even though they know they're repeating it. They figure out, I might as well stay and get it this time, and then I'll repeat it again, and maybe it will enforce the learning. So, um, what I'm saying is, I'm not sure about, um, but that is our low, kind of local policy. I'm not sure in some ways how enforceable that is, but we say it, and so, so basically, if it comes to you, you sign it. Right. Well, no, well, no, 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 no. There are cases where, and I, I had one, like I said, it's supposed to go to the academic thing, but I had a student already this semester, um, and he had missed three weeks of classes, and I said, you cannot go back to the classroom. You just cannot go back to the classroom. Um, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. Is it three consecutive or just three weeks? Consecutive. Okay. This person yeah, had that out. It's consecutive time. Because I have that. It's consecutive. It's consecutive time. I have it too. Yeah. It says here that if the equivalent of more than one week's class is missed through unexcused absences in one semester, the student will not have satisfied the attendance requirements for the course. Yeah, and that's, so but that's different from what we yeah. talked about, yeah. and that's earlier. Most people don't exactly enforce that. Like yeah. I said, it, it varies yeah. from faculty, and we do, I mean, that's, that is, as we said, that's the loose college policy, mm -hmm. and we yeah. let faculty kind of um, mm -hmm. put it on their syllabus and establish their own. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's not universally, but it is something, again, remember I said it, if it's in writing, it is something that faculty can utilize mm -hmm. to enforce their policy. So sure. you, you can use that as a reference, you know, on your, if you say that on your, um, you know, syllabus, you can um, use that as a reference to enforce that policy. Yes, so after three weeks, the student walks back in, sits down, and you say, I'm sorry, get out, and they say, no, I'm, st I mean, the thing is, we're stuck. We are not, okay. what do we do when you we should walk say, in after three You weeks? should say, after three 
four weeks the student yeah. shows up, mm -hmm. you should ask the student to speak to you after class. And the reason I'm saying yeah. that is so that don't start a scene at the beginning yeah. of the class and what's his name. Yeah. I'm always <laughs> like, you know, let's try to diffuse or prevent yeah. situations. Yeah. At the end of the class, you talk to that student and say, and you inform them how long they've been out, and you say that. Um, you need the signature of the academic dean in order to okay. return this class because you have missed a significant part of the materials and everything like that. And students will often say to you, it's all right, but I've been doing the reading and I can still keep up and I know I can pass the te test and, and that may be so, but you still have a right um, as a faculty okay. to to the so academic dean and make them explain, give give an excuse, so you, so you do. And uh, it's not students are not always let back into so the class. So it's the academic dean. Academic dean. Academic dean. Academic dean. Academic dean. It says the academic dean. Three consecutive classes. Right, but you know sometimes um, students do end up. Sometimes students do end up in my weeks. office and depend oh, upon right. yeah three consecutive weeks and depend right. upon what happens too. I just say no. So and that's Dean yeah, Affleck. Yeah, yeah. Dean Affleck. One of us, huh? That's Dean Affleck. Dean Affleck. Dean Affleck. Dean Affleck is actually a designated dean, because but they're that's they're running into people are showing up. Right? Yeah. I don't know who they are. Yeah. Are you responsible for being yeah. caught up with the work? That's a good. That's where I was going next. That's oh. a good question. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. Um, are you responsible for getting them caught up? Okay. Now, mm. let's use professional judgment here. Okay. If a student comes to you and says, "I was in the hospital and blah blah blah," and they have a doctor's note and this and that, we try to be reasonable. Right. Okay. Absolutely. All right. If students are telling you all kinds of stories about, you know, I had to work every night and this and that and the other, you don't have any responsibility to you reference the syllabus and that's it. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to coach them through all the assignments they miss and what is, or you tell them, you know what, if you want to try to get caught up, if you want to let them stay in your class, that's your decision. If you want to. If you want to let, help them get you tell them that you need to talk to another classmate. You need to refer to your syllabus, and you can talk to someone else in the class. If they want to help you, that's voluntarily. But uh, faculty do not have the responsibility to personally, you know, help students. Like I said, and there are issues that, that happen. We have one of our students who, you know, was in a bad car accident um, this fall. It was reasonable for us to try to help that student that semester. They were passing the classes, and that's kind of reasonable. So like I said, use our professional judgment. But um, technically, you don't have a responsibility for a student who has missed weeks and weeks of class for you to now spend hours and hours trying to get them up to speed. That's not your responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yes, fine. But, but if you're helping students, you should not do any less for that student. My point is, if a student who's missed one class comes to you and you give them that student material, then you know, then that's your policy in the class. But you shouldn't turn around and say, well, I'm just not going to give you anything. Because if you're helping some students, okay, that student, at least you get them get what you get given everyone else. Mm -hmm. But in my class, I, I, have, I have notes after all my lectures. So I know students are missing classes, but I have the notes. I tell them, I say, these are notes. This is not the meal, this is the menu. Right. This tells what we've done, but, it, right. but it's not me. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So. Right, yeah, and that's fine, and you can do that. And I mean, it's not just make a good point about consistency. Um, that's one thing. We do have to be consistent. Mm -hmm. And some of us had, had you know, um, in administration, of course, we have had cases where students say, well, the teacher helped this student, but they didn't help me. Mm -hmm. And we have had that situation, and we do have to say we have to be consistent. So if it's our policy not to let students make up exams, then it's our policy not to make, but make up exams. But students don't exam. necessarily know what another student has said to you. I had a student today presented a police report for sexual assault. She gets to make up her exam. The guy who said, well, I didn't feel like coming, does not get to. Okay. But I'm not explaining to the students that she didn't want. Okay, except for the quarter law that would not stand. So we try to be consistent because, and I absolutely agree with you that, again, that should be a professional judgment. But if students can, and we have had a recently CHRO case, where the student did say, and the teacher did say, well, this student, well, actually both students said they were sick. And um, one student did have a doctor's note, and one student didn't. So the teacher said that she 
let the student have doctor's note, make it up, and not tell the student. Mm -hmm. that, did, that did to become a CHRO case. Yeah. So you, we can't just easily say, you know, because this person had a good excuse, even though I understand that they it's that they did. Um, and it's in the booklet, the, the handbook, though, that they have to have a good reason to miss an exam, such as A, B, and 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 they and, and they, and, and they should. And I tell students, and I always say too, if in doubt, send them to my office. And I will make sure that, you know, we're following the regs and that right. we're doing something that's not going to end us up in court or stage or over. But like I said, we do have to be careful in terms of consistency yeah, but if, because if, we are often challenged on consistency. I think that if, it depends on the discipline as well. You can provide them with notes on a lecture, but if their notes are, are the skill building exercises that you do with them in the class, they've missed it. No matter how you look at it, they miss it. If they miss one, sure you can sit with one. If they miss six or seven, right. what do you do? Right. You well, that's why we said in the beginning you have attendance and participation right. grades on your syllabus. Right. What percentage of the class do they school. account for? So if you're saying that 30% of your class is on participation and attendance, mm -hmm. and the students miss 70% of the class, can they mm -hmm. pass the class? Probably not. So then, you know, you have to think about it. And certainly, some courses, um, as we as we um, discussed earlier, it's more important that you attend. Then that's why faculty have the flexibility to decide what percentage of their course is uh, the grade is going to be based on attendance and participation. Mm -hmm. And like I said, as long as um, as, as long as that's clear in the syllabus, students can't really argue with you about that if it's in writing on your syllabus. Right, but that really clarified my question. Okay. That's exactly what I need to hear. There was yeah. a question right here, Doris. Oh, there's actually a, a question about lab attendance because uh -huh. in, in the sciences we actually have very strict right. attendance policies right. for lab. And the syllabi actually say if you miss this many labs, excused or not. Right. I mean, there is zero for the lab, in which case you fail the course. And there's a reason for that. It makes sense, and that's appropriate. Um, but my other comment was the one about the doctor's note. Uh -huh. um, now we have new H1N1 policies, not just at this college, but most colleges. Oh, we're right. actually not required to, we can't require students to bring right. doctor's notes right. anymore. Right. They can say, that's I was homesick with the flu, and the state policy on this right. is that we don't want everyone who has flu symptoms to go to the emergency room. Ex 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 and so now we can no longer enforce those sorts of absences with notes. Right. And even before mm -hmm. that, um, some of you may lost. remember in September, Dean Affleck addressed the whole thing, and yeah. she mm -hmm. asked the faculty to be relaxed mm -hmm. about that right. because, quite frankly, we did not want students coming yes. to school right. sick and contaminating the whole building and perhaps, you know, us having some kind of um, outbreak. So we, we, we were being relaxed on that, but... But the problem is it makes it very hard to enforce those attendance rules, especially the strict laboratory mm -hmm. rules. You, I can't really... I, mean, I can sit with a student for three hours, but it is nothing like attending the lab. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and so it makes it hard to say, well, right. you know, you missed the four labs because, you know, they, right. you know, they went partying right. for three, and then all of a sudden they have the three, right. three four. Right. But that's an... Ex but like I said, you know, the, the issue with the H1N1 was an exception in general, but for the most part... Is that not true anymore? I mean, I think, huh? I think still, that continues. No, no, that still continues, but I'm saying that's an exception. But that doesn't change faculty's ability to have attendance policies in general. Like I said, for that, like I said, we did ask, and like I said, there is a state statute now on that. But in general, like I said, um, it makes sense what you're saying about why you have st strict attendance policies in a lot. That makes sense, and you still should try to enforce it. Does that kind of stand for that? Um, I don't want to jump in front of that, but, but I've heard you say attendance and participation. Participation, yes, but there's a case law out there that says very clearly that you can't about attendance. Students are challenged that. Students are challenged, but law, I still. This case law on that. Students, do, students can say, challenge that, and they're talking about, you know, students have a right to fail. But I still say faculty have the right to establish attendance policy in their courses that is appropriate with their courses. Like I said, some faculty don't really care as long as students do the work past their exams. But like I said, in the lab, um, it makes perfectly good sense. How are you going to miss, miss, you know, a large number of labs and pass the course? Or, you know, certain courses, attendance is very important. And you can have, and some faculty, it's totally up to the faculty how they divide. 
Some have specific attendance policy and specific participation, and some have attendance and participation grouped as, you know, 25% of your grade, they put them together. So, like I said, but I, I, I maintain that um, that is a faculty prerogative in terms of, you know, Dean Affleck here. Yeah, <laughs> she can, you she can tell me if I'm wrong, yeah, but. You do I, need to call it participation because you can't, you, you, uh, you can't, you're supposed to grade them on learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not on attendance. Attendance, yeah, yeah. you know, so. But, but if you is wish to, labs to have a required, my experience, and I, you know, I imagine, so I teach a different course, you know, every semester, and so I, I try to follow the rule of Rome, like what the attendance policy for the course is, and it generally is there's a number, you know, when you miss the fourth lab, that's it, zero for the lab. When you miss the second lab, the micro, you're in the same position. And this is not just me, it's how the whole, I mean, we all try to, you know, there's a bunch of us teaching the course, and we try to have consistent attendance policies. And yet, you know, I know that we're in a t tricky situation in that, you know, if someone called me on it, I don't know that I would be legally allowed to do that, or... You can... You I mean, can, you're saying I can't I'm have that policy. I'm just saying this case law. The, press, the case saying, precedent is... Mm -hmm. So I'm just use the word participation instead. Yes. And it's kind of like... It's a, it's a, it's a sub-word right. for attendance. Yes. Right. right. Yes, it is. And, and, and you are saying, you are in effect saying that this does impact their learning outcomes and that they won't have this material if they don't participate or or that you think participation and what they do in participating is something that you want them to learn but strictly speaking Paul Susan has told us that we cannot because of this case law grade a student because if you were if you were challenged what grade is supposed to be based on is the learning outcome. So you can have a participation grade, though that has stood up. So it's yes, it's a it's a little bit of a cheat. It's a little bit of a cheat. Uh, it's a little bit of a maneuver, but lots of so maybe are. semantics, but still yeah, you yes. have a right to yes. put so we can't part, have participation. Policies. You have but a that we say have after policy, the fourth lab you can have a policy, policy in your catalog that is the board policy that uses the word participation. It does say three classes or something, and it's up to the faculty, but it uses the word participation. Okay. So you can say that that participation, because I, you're saying, you're saying you look at their participation as one of the things, one of the components of the grade. Right. You're okay. assessing their intellectual the performance mm -hmm. right. by that participation. So then you have, in reality, tied it to learning outcomes. And sometimes, by by you learn something about a student and the way they think through that participation, that will enable you to teach that student better or to massage how they report on their learning outcomes. So yes, you can do it, uh, um, but there is that there is that we were told by the chief academic officer not to use the word attendance. He told me to take it out of the catalog, which I did. Mm. All right, can, can I? She's been and then Jeff. She's been so patient. I'm just hanging in there. Okay. My question uh, is this: um, We cannot give a zero for a student not attending an exam. I'm, for example, I'm going to be giving a major test uh, Wednesday. About three students I can already predict will not be there. Okay. If I cannot give them a zero, even though I have, you know, announced the test and I've emailed and da 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 da, and I handed out the policy, which I copied out of the handbook. If I can't give the zero, who, uh, who, where do I find the time to have each of them make it up? I mean, you can't give them a zero. I thought someone was going to say we can't give a zero if they if they don't show up for an exam. No, you can't give them a zero. Like I said, the only time we should consider is use professional judgment if a student comes and says, you know, has a good reason. Oh yeah, a good medical, reason is oh, that doesn't add that stuff. But in general, if the student doesn't show up. It's the faculty's right prerogative to okay. give them a zero if they miss that test. Otherwise, there could be three different hour and a half side so Oh, yeah, yeah. Remember, I said that you have no responsibility to spend all that time okay. making up for students. Like I said, obviously, we want to be compassionate to students. Oh, like I said, if yes. we, and if we, you know, if they have a good reason, you know, and the cat died, and all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I did oh, have I a dog have that, died in the fall <laughs> semester. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so, then anyway. that's important. Yeah, that's right. I just. 
Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify with okay. the participation and attendance, Mark. It's not just a matter of semantics because there are some people have in the past had policies where if you miss this many classes you fail. Oh, I know. I okay. know. That's that is that so we're we're not saying now you can just say if you miss this many classes you are not participating and therefore you fail. You know what I mean? It's it's a the participation is a percentage of the grade. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and cannot be used in a punitive way like the the that kind of attendance policy. Right. Exactly. Right. So that's right. That's what we're okay. clarifying. And like I said we may have to as I I I, I spoke um, before I referenced, you know, in terms of catalog of this and that, and we do, and I'm not, I, I'm not sure, I didn't, I didn't see the final version that just went to the printer, um, because we did have a policy, right. as we said in there, I don't know if Mary had cleared yeah. that up, about well, the, it, that it actually says, referenced says, we, 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 said, we, we, we called, it, we used the word participation, and we said the rule of thumb is if you so miss three classes or something yeah. like that, um, you know, it's a, it's a problem with your effective it's it's general language and it's board policy and the language is very general right. okay. and open to interpretation. But the the learning outcomes are what students are graded on. So what if you wish to make participation in class right. one way that you assess learning outcomes? That's completely right. accepted. And sometimes it makes sense. We had a student in the fall who was in a group dynamics class. So first of all, they, they came after the class had met twice. And so, that's not good, starting off that way. And then, so they only had, you know, um, by, uh, you know, uh, to the teacher's uh, point of view was, at most, you know, they might be allowed to miss one more class. So, you know what I'm saying, is it reasonable to the student, I'm saying to the student, is it reasonable and a group dynamics course yeah. to have missed the first two that makes sense. No, you're in a group dynamics course. <laughs> the wrong, you know, seventy five percent of the course about interaction and then doing those kinds of things. So, you know, we have to use common sense. Like I said, where some you know, I have some of the computer faculty members say, No, this is a project um orientated kind of course. We need the students to do the project. Mm -hmm. And I don't really care that much about if they attend the class because that's not part of the outcome. The outcome is were they able to read these materials and interpret them and do the project at the end? And they were okay with that. So, uh, and if you're in teaching in a science lab, obviously, I, is that a science lab? Is that what you do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, obviously, the lab, um, use of the lab and the experiments that you do, um, there's it's sequential learning. So of course you need them to know the techniques from class one, class two, mm -hmm. class three, yeah. class four. So, so if they're, they've missed all those and they want to come to lab number five, you would be perfectly reasonable in saying that you don't have the knowledge base at this point to participate in the lab. In the nursing, but that's based on they don't that's participation. They don't know the techniques. In our nursing curriculum, um, at any point, they can fail clinical. And if they're um, uh, certainly if they didn't come, because the clinical um, hours and the clinical learning is sequential and incremental and it builds on it. So you, you may have to think a little more carefully about your policy but you, and how you word it because of the, the, the case law that is out there, but you certainly can um, use participation in class yeah. as one index and, and how you structure that there's certainly a variety of ways you can do it. Absolutely. You can get yeah. two points for every lab. So that's 30% of the day. You have 15 weeks. If you're a meeting once a week, you can give two points for every lap. Every completion, every completed lap gets two points. Mm -hmm. You know. It's kind of an easier case because your lab is your participation. Mm -hmm. You must 
Yeah. Uh, I, 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 is the lab yeah, is yeah, yeah. It is the, you know. Well, no, we get exams and grades for other things. Yeah. Yeah. Also. But, yeah. But, but that's the that cool. you got to do the stuff. Yeah. 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 That, you know, that's right. why we have yeah. it. Right. So then they have stayed. Right. So on your syllabus, if you submit, if you, yeah. On your syllabus, though, if you, if you, if you assign a significant amount of points to that, then the students have to be there because they can't pass the course without being there. Math is too much, too. Yes, let's yeah, and, and then we want to also we want to um, um, save some time for questions. Okay, so we did everything we could, and we know all the policies, and we tried to be proactive. Um, then, what do we do when we uh, encounter a problem situation in the class? Um, okay, so we have a situation in the classroom. What do we do? Okay, first of all, we want to um, remain calm and remain in control. Remember, these are the classroom managers, and um, you know you always want to kind of um, maintain that status. So even in a, in a situation, and as we, we were talking about earlier, whenever possible, we always want to diffuse situations. So if something comes up, we can speak to the student at the end of the class. That's better than confronting them there or starting off your, your, your class in that situation. But, you know, we immediately need to be able to assess the nature of the situation and, you know, is this emergency? Do we need to deal with this right now? Or, like I said, is this something that can weigh at this issue where I'm going to speak to the student at the end of the class or I'm going to come and, you know, speak to my department chair or the dean of students or what are we going to do? So let's try to quickly and calmly assess um, what the situation is. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, one of the first questions, is this emergency situation? This emergency situation, you know, all of us at, you know, all the classrooms have phones in the back. Um, there, the red phones on the hallways that you pick them up, they go directly to um, public safety or whatever. So, you know, if it's an emergency situation, then we need to handle it in that manner. Like I said, without, you know, um, you know, frightening the students in the class and all that kind of stuff, we, we can prevent it, um, you know. Use your professional judgment. Like I said, you may need to go to the back of the classroom. You may need to decide it's kind of emergency, but I think if I step out to the hallway and use the red phone, that may be better than inciting the situation. So maybe I need to, maybe I should go out and use um, the red phone. So, um, in an emergency situation, like I said, we should not hesitate to take emergency measures, which usually means calling public safety. Sorry, sorry. So, like I said, and if you think, you know, there's a problem in this classroom that I think um, might be escalating, but I don't want to further inside to step out, pick up on the red phones, on, on, and you can call them without people in the classroom knowing you're calling. Right. And That's public it. safety will appear, so let's use common sense and professional judgment. And, and sometimes it has absolutely nothing to do with the class or you, or it's usually something, and honestly, it's going on in their own personal life, mm -hmm. and they're just trying oh, yeah. to... Right. Get right through the day, right. and, and if it can be diffused, right. it's better that even if they get furious at you, right. speak right. to them afterwards. Right. And remember some of the things we we spoke about in terms of our student population and the whole mix, you know, mm -hmm. and the challenges they bring, and, and there's like, and sometimes right, and sometimes you know, also when I talk to students and I ask like what incited them, you know, sometimes it's because. Um, a, um, a teacher says something to me, it all, often comes up, you know, that was disrespectful, this and that, or remind, when I get to the bottom of it, it often has to do with some other association in life they have. So we have to remember that there's another association. Maybe you said that, you weren't really meaning that, but the association was they've been in a, another schooling situation, or they've been in work situation, there's some place else where they're making that connection in their mind that, you know, right. this. And it usually is, and it really and truly, it usually isn't the instructor. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been teaching since before there was electricity, so <laughs> what I found out was when a student melts down, it's normally something in their personal life. If you can hold it and roll and get to the end of the class, right. yeah. If you can use they usually come out and tell you what Yeah, and so and yeah. often yeah, to take that approach, that's why I said whenever we can we we'll always should be trying to diffuse the situation so we don't disrupt the whole right. class right. situation. Right. Um, but like I said, if we have emergency then we need to act like it's emergency and, you know, mm -hmm. call public safety or whoever. Where are these phones? Uh, 
Pardon? Where, where's the phone? The I'm red doing, phone on the thing? walls. You see yeah. red phones hanging on the walls outside, on, the, on these long walls? Okay. Um, most of the floors have two or three red phones on them. I know people don't necessarily pay attention right. to them, but you simply yeah. pick them up. You don't have to dial anything. They go directly to oh, public okay. safety. And like I said, while each, you know, the classrooms have a phone, like I said, sometimes it may not be appropriate, yeah. okay. you know, so you may decide. Excuse me, class, for one moment. Continue to work. And I'm going to, mm -hmm. and you say to yourself, I'm going to step outside and okay. pick up the red phone. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, they have a direct line. So if you have a cell phone, you yeah. need to walk to the garage, or you want to call them from outside, that you know something, and there's an emergency they need to know about. They're, they're very accommodating. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. They can, they can always, and they're typically here if, okay. we, if we have a situation. But like I said, the main thing is that, you know, remain calm, assess the situation, and decide. You know, like I said, we don't want to try to escalate situations and uh, yeah. put ourselves in harm's way, put anybody else in the class in harm's way. And like I said, and oftentimes, as I think someone pointed out, you know, um, sometimes it's just a bad day, and that student mm -hmm. hasn't been a problem before, and they're just having a meltdown. Right. And you know, the way we handle it means that we probably may never have a problem with that student again. They may later on, they may thank you because you know. But so, like I said, depending upon um, you know how um, we handle it, and uh, so we also have um, you know many students who are part of our population who um, don't. Um, who are disenfranchised, as I might say, and don't feel as respected in general. And so when things, you know, um, happen in the classroom, again, they're making an association. Not that, you know, my relationship with you, you know, for the first 14 weeks of class has been okay, but this day, so like I said, sometimes, or sometimes it's just a pull of, you know, working and, you know, I had to take my child to daycare at 7 a.m. this morning, you know, then I had to go to work, and then I came here at 5.30 to go to class. So, mm -hmm. um, like I said, but anything we can do to diffuse the situation. Mm -hmm. And also know, again, you know, knowing your resources um, at the college, which include um, the parmenteers, as uh, Jeffy Partridge knows, and, you know, these are students when you're having issues. And we, you know, and the student handbook also say counselors. And if I could just wrap up one thing, I, want, I do want to say this, to clarify what policy we have that you can utilize too. If students are having a really bad day or if you know, it's the second time they're having a problem, like I said, the first time you might tell them to go talk to a counselor because you said something. Um, you know, otherwise, you know, faculty can say to students, and like I said, I do advise that the situation um, lives itself to that. Wait till the end of class and say this to them, look, you know, you had a real problem to, um, today in class, and, and, you know, that was a challenge for all of us, and um, do not want you to return to class until you see the dean of students. Mm -hmm. So faculty do have the right to put the student out until they see the dean of So we can't just kick students out. But, you know, you do have the right to say, you can't return to my class. And many of you in this classroom know, then I write them a note in order for them to come back. They have had to see me, and I write them a note in order for them to return. Or I said, this is a problem. I'm going to talk to the, you know, if this is, I feel, a problem that's not going to work. And, you know, I'm going to work with the department chair to try to come up with another resolution or something else. So we do want to, you know, we do want to be mindful of that option. I think it's, it's just that we get, we get such a very group here, but everybody comes in with steamer trunks full of pain, and it's really, really and truly, and to go through the front doors takes a tremendous amount of courage to get here to begin with. Mm -hmm. and if you keep that in mind all the way through the semester, when they do have a meltdown, if you can just be there for them and just let them melt down and get over it, they get over it, and they really do get over it without calling too much Right, but as we said, let's try to start off the semester on a good note, like I said, and, you know, use your syllabus, use your tools, use the policies of the institution that are in the student handbook and stuff um, to enforce and lay down, you know, um, upfront investment, you know, if you spend a half hour in your first class, you know, as we said, creating an environment of respect and, and saying, you know, creating what is civil, you know, so everybody understands what's going to be civil behavior, what's going to be expected classroom behavior, you know, from the student handbook and those kinds of things, it could possibly go a long way. So, and I know Nancy's signaling. I don't know, Nancy, if you want to spend any more time. I, some people may have 5.30 class. Yeah. The time is now 5.15, but I'm here to answer questions.